Welcome to the American Sleep and Breathing Academy Sleep and Wellness Conference for Healthcare Professionals 2014 Electrode Application Techniques. In this presentation, we will be discussing the basic monitoring devices and how to hook up and visual, visual signs of proper placement. Reasons for properly placing and applying electrodes, and how to apply an electrode. Let's start with the monitoring electrodes or devices that are used and placed on the patient's body during a normal baseline polysogram polysomnogram or PSG study. Keep in mind these are not all of the leads used, but that they are most commonly used. These include the cup electrodes, clip or snap leads, snore sensors or microphones, oximeters, respiratory bands, body position sensors, thermistor and thermocouples, and transducers. There are several types of wires and sensors used in the polysomnography. We will be discussing a variety of electrodes and leads. So what is the difference between an electrode and a lead? An electrode is anything that is placed on the body to collect information from an electrical current. A lead is any wire that attaches to an electrode to complete the collection process. The first type of wire is a cup electrode. The image shown here shows a gold cup electrode, one of the more common types of electrodes. It is called a gold cup because part of the wire that is attached to the patient is in a gold shape and is plated with a thin layer of gold. This allows it to be highly conductive and therefore pick up very small electrode impulses. The gold cup electrode is the most commonly used wire for EEGs because it is capable of picking up such a small electrical impulses from the brain. Gold cup electrodes can be applied to any part of the body and are generally the best type of wire for carrying signals from the patient to the amplifier. Cup electrodes should always be used to read EEG or brain signals. However, since their shape makes it different, difficult to apply them to some parts of the body, and because they are usually quite expensive, it is not always reasonable to use cup electrodes for the entire patient hookup. If you are going to use cup electrodes, make sure they are all similar metals, as they come in variety of metals and are not all gold plated. You may use clip or snap lead wires to acquire other signals that are not EEG. We recommend you always refer to your lab's protocol for specific preferences. This is a picture of a typical snap lead. This is a typical Clip lead. Clip and snap leads are also widely used in polysomnography. While not quite as electrically conductive as cup electrodes, they are easier to apply and less expensive. They are used in conjunction with small, sticky electrodes that have a button like connect connector at the top. The lead either snaps or clips onto the electrode, which then sticks to the patient. The electrode, which is the only part that actually touches the patient, can be thrown away after each use and the lead wire can be reused. Snap and clip lead wires are possibly the most commonly used wires on a patient's body. They are sometimes used on the face as well. However, they should not be used on a patient's head as they will not stick to the scalp through the hair. Snore and microphones and snore sensors are especially 
Specialty wires. They are used exclusively for the purpose of detecting the patient's snore. Snore sensors work by detecting vibrations in the throat and sending these vibrations in a waveform to the amplifier. Snore microphones detect noise and convert the noise to a waveform which is then sent to the amplifier. Both types are placed on the patient's throat slightly off center where vibrations are most easily felt during a cough or snore. They are usually disc shaped with one side being either slightly larger or slightly raised. This is the side that would be placed against the patient's skin. The oximeter is probably the most important sensor used in sleep apnea patients. The oximeter gives the technician a percentage of how much hemoglobin in the patient's blood is saturated by oxygen. This reading is called the SpO2, which stands for the oxygen saturation measured by the pulse oximeter. The the SAO2 is a similar measurement, but is generally more accurate as it is measured by an arterial blood gas, or ABG. The oximeter should be placed on the patient's finger, as seen in this, these images, so that the red light shining on one side can be detected through the patient's finger by the part of the sensor on the other side of the patient's finger. The sensor detects how much oxygen is in the patient's blood by the brightness of the light through the patient's finger. Therefore, it is very important to keep the finger sensor clean. If the oximeter cannot be placed on the patient's finger due to some abnormality, the patient's toes or earlobes can be used. However, these may not be as accurate as the readings from the finger and the sensor may not stay on as well throughout the night. A flex oximeter. These type of oximeters are usually used by wrapping the sensor around the finger. Used a lot in polysomnography because they seem to be more comfortable and stay on longer. Respiratory bands are placed around the patient's chest and abdomen to detect the patient's effort to breathe. As you will learn as a technician, patients with sleep apnea frequently stop breathing in their sleep. It is important for the scoring technologist and the sleep physician to know if the patient is attempting to breathe. Typically, there are two types of belts being used to measure this effort, piezo and respiratory and respiratory inductive plus augraphy, or commonly known as RIP belts. A piezo belt has a sensor that detects changes in the strain of an elastic belt that is connected to the sensor and wraps around the patient's chest or abdomen. The sensor then converts the strain to a signal that can be read by the amplifier. The sensor in the RIP belt, however, is not separate from the elastic belt. A wire, rather, is woven into the entire length of the elastic belt detecting very minor efforts, giving a more accurate reading of overall patient respiratory effort. Now we'll move on to the body position sensor. The body position sensors detect the patient's body position. These are usually placed on the thoracic or chest belt and are displayed on the polysomnograph as either supine, left, right, prone, or upright. Some body position sensors include more detailed positions such as left, supine, right, prone, etc. The body position sensors shown here has Velcro that attaches to the respiratory belt. Sleep technicians will need to watch very closely to the readings of these sensors through video because body position sensors are not very accurate all of the time. 
The thermistor or thermocouple detects changes in temperature and is used to produce a waveform based on the patient's airflow. The thermistor or thermocouple should be placed directly underneath the patient's nose with each of the two prongs just below each nostril. Most thermistors and thermocouples have a small mouthpiece that extends down. This is a pressure transducer. transducer. It detects changes in pressure that also produce a waveform based on the patient's airflow. Using two methods to measure the patient's airflow ensures an accurate reading. We will move on to the hookup and electrode placement. Now that we have provided an overview of the various monitoring devices, it is impor now important to give you a visual idea of where these devices are placed on the patient's body. A typical hookup includes scalp hookup, which has nine electrodes. Face and neck hookup has seven electrodes. Upper body hookup has six electrodes or devices and a lower body, which has four electrodes. Therefore, the total amount of electrodes and devices on a typical adult patient hookup is about 26 electrodes. Now that we have provided an overview of the various monitoring devices, it's now important to give you an idea where these devices are placed on the patient's body. We will now discuss briefly the locations of electrodes and leads that are placed on the patient's body during a normal baseline PSG. Let's start with the scalp. There are nine electrode scalps or scalp electrode points that are required for a standard study. Some studies that investigate more severe sleep disorders may require more. These electrodes are placed at a specific point on the scalp. We will not discuss at this time how to find these points, but rather show you where they are generally placed as learning proper electrode placements as the objective of this particular course. The names of the nine scalp points are ground or FPZ, F3, F4, C3, C4, O1, O2, M1, and M2. The letters are identifiers for the location. They are placed on the head and the numbers are the identifiers for the point and hemisphere of the head they are placed. Even numbers are for the right side of the head. Odd numbers are for the left side of the head. The patient ground wire will go on the middle of the forehead at FPZ. Some sleep systems require two ground leads and the second ground can be placed at FC, CZ, PZ, or at any other location on the forehead. The other sites, F3, F4, C3, C4, O1, O2, M1 and M2 are placed in specific locations based off the EEG 1020 system. For our purposes in this lesson, these locations can be seen generally in the image. For each of the nine sites, you will use gold cup electrodes as described earlier. The face and neck hookup includes seven electrodes or devices. These include the EOG leads, or eyes, two electrodes, the thermistor or thermocouple plus transducer, one device and one cannula. The chin EMG is three electrodes. The snore sensor and microphone, one sensor.
The electro-ocular graphy or EOG lights leads these electrodes will record the eye movements and assist in determining sleep staging. These leads include E1 and E2. The E1 lead goes out and down from the outside corner of the left eye and is placed on the left outer canthus. The E2 lead goes out from the outside corner of the right eye and is placed on the right outer canthus. Gold cup electrodes are mostly most widely used for this particular recording. However, clip or snap electrodes are also used. Again, we encourage you to review your lab's protocol. The electro-ocular graphy or EOG light leads these electrodes will record the eye movements and assist in determining your sleep stages. The thermistor or thermocouple and pressure transducer, the next the thermistor and thermocouple and pressure, pressure transducer are placed directly underneath the patient's nose. With each of the two prongs just below or in front of each nostril. The mouthpiece should be placed out in front and slightly below the closed mouth, so it can detect airflow when the mouth is open. A transducer should be placed with the thermistor or thermocouple just below the nose as seen in the image. The chin EMG consists of three electrodes, typically gold cup electrodes. The chin electrodes should be placed flat against the skin to ensure stability throughout the night. Electrodes are placed on the chin to detect the muscle tone of the chin and jaw area. The muscle tone in this area will be slightly lower during sleep than during relaxed wakefulness and even lower during REM sleep than during non-REM sleep. One chin lead should be placed one centimeter above the jawline at the center point. Another should be placed two centimeters down to the right of center underneath the jawline. And a third should be placed two centimeters down to the left of center underneath the jawline. Lastly, the snore sensor or microphone should be placed just slightly off to the center of the patient's throat. Most technicians find it helpful to feel the patient's throat as he or she talks or coughs in order to find a location where vibrations can be easily felt. The snore sensor detects vibrations from the patient's upper airway, which gives a graphical de depiction of snores and other noises from the throat. Snoring is the result of a partial obstruction of the airway and therefore is very important to monitor when diagnosing and treating respiratory related sleep disorders such as obstructive sleep apnea. Upper body hookup. Six electrodes or devices. These include EKG leads, three electrodes, respiratory belts, two belts, and body position sensor. Many polysomnographs use montages that use two EKG leads. With two lead system, detailed EKG arrhythmias cannot be monitored. However, some EKG arrhythmias such as sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, PVC, and others can be accurately detected. In a two lead EKG hookup, the lead should be placed with one just under the collar bone on the right side and one four intercostal spaces up on the left rib cage. If your system allows a third EKG lead, this third lead should be placed just under the collar bone on the left side as shown. It may be appropriate to place the leads directly on the collarbones of large patients. 
If the leads are placed too low on patients with large chests, muscle artifact may enter the tracing and make it difficult to see the true EKG reading. Respiratory effort and body position sensor is measured by two respiratory belts, one around the thorax and the other around the abdomen as shown. The body position sensor is generally placed on the thorax or upper belt. The belts are generally made of an elastic material. Since the bands are stretchy, they are usually comfortable for the patient to wear, even if they are pulled tight. The belt should be tight enough around the patient to achieve optimal readings based on the subdural thorax and abd abdominal movements, but not too tight to restrict the patient's breathing. When applying the belts, it is important that they do not get twisted as this can limit the belt's ability to monitor, monitor sub, subtle changes in effort. Lower body hookup includes four electrodes for leg EMG. The final part of an adult patient full body hookup is the leg EMG. Two electrodes should be placed on the lower half of each leg. The anterior tibialis muscle runs alongside the tibia bone on the outside of the shin. Foot and leg movements can be detected best from this muscle. The electrodes may be placed offset from each other horizontally and vertically so as to detect foot and leg movements. If with your diagnostic system, EKG artifact shows predominantly in leg EMGs, you may align the electrodes so that they are in line with each other vertically and so that they are parallel to the heart. Placing electrodes in this manner will help eliminate EKG artifact, yet still enables electrodes to detect foot and leg movements. The distance between the two electrodes should be approximately two centimeters. Leg movements are important to detect because they can indicate disturbances in sleep that may not be detected by the EEG channels. In addition, many patients have sleep disorders such as restless leg syndrome that can cause involuntary leg movements during wake and sleep. Why should we have proper electrode placement? Number one, for patient comfort and to withstand movement, clear readings with low impedances. As one can see from this overview of a full patient hookup, approximately half of the hookups include electrodes that must be attached securely to the patient's body and approximately half are, to, are devices that need to be placed in the appropriate spot in order to collect the best data. Electrodes that are attached to the patient properly will reap the best outcomes, while improperly placed electrodes can cause stress to the technician and disturbance to the patient. As the technician will find it necessary to enter the room to fix leads that have loosened or been removed. Therefore, electrode placement and application is important. For patient comfort, a happy patient will always make a study go smoother, and a vital part of a patient's happiness is placing and applying these electrodes so that they will be comfortable for the patient. Withstanding movement and wear as the night progresses. If an electrode isn't placed well, the technician will be required to tend to that electrode so that it can acquire the appropriate data necessary in diagnosing the patient. Lastly, and possibly the most importantly, proper electrode placement is required to give a clear reading with low impedances throughout the night. For those that are unfamiliar with the term impedances, this is defined as the opposition of a signal transmission. 
from the... In other words, this is how clear the signal will transmit from the patient to the electrode and ultimately the monitoring equipment. Impedances are typically found by using an impedance meter. Some PSG equipment has these built in or you can purchase a separate meter to detect the impedances. Impedances should always be kept below 10 cones. A properly placed and secured electrode will produce the clearest and best reading for the technologist to score and the physician to read. Electrode application. Since low impedances are an important factor in collecting the most beneficial data on a patient, let's discuss on how to prepare the site and apply an electrode so that it can be produce high quality signal. There are five basic steps to applying electrode. Step one, find the site. Step two, prep the site. Step three, prepare the electrode. Step four, place the electrode. Step five, apply the electrode. Find the correct site. The first step in applying electrode. This is very important in PSG as many different signals can be received from different areas of the head and body. Finding the correct site for electrode placement is done by careful measurements, utilizing specific bones and muscles as landmarks. Technicians use tape measures when finding EEG locations. The second step after the correct site has been found for the placement of the electrode is that the site must be prepared. In order to minimize impedances, each site must be thoroughly cleaned and prepped before the electrode is applied. The most common method used to prep sites on the scalp is by using a cotton swab and prepping a solution. such as new prep or omni prep. These sites will have markings on them from when you measure the patient's head. These markings should be erased by the prepping solution and any dirt, hairs, and dead skin should be removed. Be sure to scrub gently, But keep in mind, you are purposely trying to remove anything that could impede the electrode ability to connect with the scalp. Prepping solutions are electrically conductive so that they do not need to be removed before applying gold cups. Other electrode sites on the patient's skin should be wiped clean with a gauze pad after prepping. Large wrinkles and loose clothing should be pulled tight before placing the respiratory belts around the patient's chest and abdomen. Usually wrinkles in clothing will not cause large problems in the readings of the belts, but loose clothing can cause them not to read as well. Sometimes it is helpful to shave the parts on a patient's chest where the EKG electrodes will be placed, rather than ripping the hairs off with the electrode in the morning. The third step is sim simple yet important. To prepare the electrode, you should first make sure it has been cleaned and sterilized. Normally, this is done immediately after the patient is unhooked from the equipment in the morning, but it is always important to double check. Cups need to be filled with electric electrically conductive paste or gel. Without this, impedances will be very high a generous amount of EEG paste should be applied to the electrode until the cup is more than completely full. The fourth step is to place the electrode. Make sure you are placing the electrode in the proper location. Keep in mind that one patient may differ from another, so electrode sites are not always set in stone. For example, the chin electrodes on a patient with a heavy beard may have to be put slightly different place than on the patient without a beard.
The lead wire should be faced toward the location where you want to gather the wires together, usually behind the head as you can see the technician is doing in this picture. A small, of electric, a small amount of electrically conductive gel may need to be placed in the middle of some snap or a clip electrodes. Cups should be filled with electronic, electrically conductive paste, such as 1020 or LFX, LFX or gel such as Signagel. The electrodes should be placed flat, pressed firmly against the skin. Make sure that the gauze or tape over the gold cup and the sticky part of the snap or clip lead is not wrinkled, but is spread out across the flat, across the skin. This will help ensure that there is as much contact as possible between the electrode and the skin. The fifth and final step is to apply the electrode or secure it to the head. For a couple electrodes, once the site has been prepped and the electrode is placed, spread a small piece of gauze or tape reinforcing the EEG paste from the electrode. Approximately a one inch square or one inch piece of tape flat over the cut. Angle the gauze so that one corner extends down over the wire itself and the opposite corner extends to the other side of the cup. The cup should be directly in the center of the gauze or the tape. The EEG paste should be holding the cup in place. The gauze or tape reinforces the hold. There are products available such as EC2 cream which dries hard and creates an even stronger hold if necessary. When application is complete, the gold cup should be flat against the scalp with the gauze or tape placed flat and spread out over the gold cup and attached firmly to the scalp. When applying snap or clip electrodes to the face and body the, in the same basic principles apply. These electrodes come sticky on one side. The sticky side should be spread out flat against the patient's skin. The center of these electrodes is a place where the electricity is conducted from the patient's head to the lead wire. So it's very important to make sure these, this part of the electrode is tight and flat against the skin. If this part is raised, it cannot conduct electricity from the patient. After the electrode has been applied and the lead wire is attached, it is often useful to place a small strip or tape over the lead wire to help hold it in place. Another small strip of tape can, lead, can then be placed over the top of the head of the lead wire, directly over the part that snaps or clips onto the electrode. However, too much tape can be de detrimental, causing discomfort for the patient. Therefore, only use what is necessary to secure the lead. We will now watch a short video clip that illustrates these five steps on how to apply an electrode so that impedances are minimally and signals are optimal. Unfortunately, the video clip is unable to play, so we'll move on to the next. Review, monitoring devices. In this presentation, we showed you various monitoring devices that should be familiar with as a night technician. These devices include gold cup electrodes, snap or clip electrodes, snore sensors, oximeters, respiratory belts, body position sensors, thermistor or thermocouple pressure transducers. We discussed where electrodes and devices should be placed and how to prepare and apply an electrode. A full hookup. At the end of the hookup, 
and after placing and applying all of the electrodes, your patient should look generally like the patients seen in these images. Tonight we are going to be performing an overnight sleep study on former Arizona Cardinals NFL player and pro player health alliance sleep apnea awareness advocate Mark Walzak. He is undergoing a live public sleep study presented by the American Sleep and Breathing Academy to help raise awareness for sleep disorder treatment and education. Tonight while Mark sleeps we are anticipating seeing something called obstructive sleep apnea. He has tested positive for sleep apnea in the past. I want to cover the basics of sleep apnea and what to watch for while he sleeps. Obstructive sleep apnea, also known as OSA, is the most common sleep-related breathing disorder. It occurs because of a blockage in the airway. Most of the time, the tongue falls back while the patient is sleeping to block it, or muscle tissues from overweight necks can create an obstructive sleep apnea. Apneas, or a complete cessation of airflow for at least 10 seconds during the sleep. It includes obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, or mixed. In order for an event to be scored as an apnea, it must be at least 10 seconds in length. Some of the signs and symptoms are snoring, interrupted sleep, choking and gasping for air, night sweats, daytime fatigue, difficulty maintaining sleep, arm and leg movements in sleep, headaches, dry mouth or sore throat, weight gain, depression, mood changes, and loss of sexual drive. Identifying the obstructive sleep apnea on a PSG requires that we use respiratory effort belts to see the patient is making an effort to breathe. Usually during an obstructive event, the airflow channel will either decrease in amplitude or go completely flat. The respiratory effort channels will still show a normal flow wave pattern. Here we will see what an obstructive sleep apnea looks like. Central apnea, a complete cessation of airflow and thoracic and abdomen, abdomen efforts. Apnea is a cessation or stopping in breathing. A central apnea event is defined as a complete cessation of airflow and thoracic abdominal efforts. Causes of central sleep apnea occur when the brain fails to transmit a signal to the muscles associated with breathing. Central sleep apnea can be caused by a number of conditions that affect the ability of your brain stem to function properly. The brain stem links to your brain to your spinal cord and controls many functions such as heart rate and breathing. On a PSG, central apneas can be identified by a complete lack of effort at the exact same time as a complete lack of airflow begins. The airflow and effort return at the same time. The clinical definition of a central apnea event is a complete sensation of airflow and thoracic abdomen efforts. Here you see airfall and your thoracic and abdomen efforts. In a mixed apnea, it is rare and appear to have both central and obstructive component to them. Mixed apneas are identified as a cessation of both the airflow and respiratory effort, but the effort returning before the airflow. 
Mixed apneas are usually predominantly central or predominantly obstructive. Here is a mixed apnea. You will see the airflow, the thoracic, and the abdomen effort. Shane Stokes respiration. This type of central sleep apnea is most commonly associated with congestive heart failure or stroke and is characterized by a rhythmic gradual increase and then decrease in breathing effort and airflow. During the weakest breathing and effort, a total lack of airflow central apneas can occur. Here you will see Shane Stokes respiration or CSR is detected on a PSG by a gradual waning and waxing pattern of airflow. Shane Stokes respirations generally cannot be detected on a 30 second epic and can require up to 300 second pages to identify the pattern. Hypoventilation or respiratory depression occurs when the ventilation is inadequate to perform the needed gas exchange in the lungs and bloodstream. Hypoventilation causes an increased concentration of carbon dioxide, hypercapnia, and respiratory acidosis. When breathing abnormally, slows carbon dioxide, dioxide levels can rise, which can lead to inadequate oxygen in the blood. Hypoventilation can be a dangerous side effect for patients with sleep apnea. apneas. Obstructive continued or increased inspiratory effort throughout the period of an absent airflow. Central. Absence of inspiratory effort throughout the period of, of that period of absent airflow. And mixed. Absent inspiratory effort in the initial portion of the event, followed by a resumption of inspiratory effort in the second portion of the event. Hypopneas. Drop in airflow signal by 30% of baseline. Duration of drop lasts about 10 seconds, and there is an 4% desaturation from pre-vent baseline and at least 90% of the event dur duration must meet the amplitude reduction or requirement or drop in pressure signal by 50% duration of at least 10 seconds and there is a drop 3% desaturation from pre-vent baseline and at least 90% of the event duration must meet the amplitude reduction requirement. And you can see the top line is decreased. Arrera or respiratory effort related arousal. They are much like hypopneas, however, they do not have the qualifying desaturation and the event must be followed by an EEG arousal. And here you see an example on a 30 second epic. and there's the respiratory followed by the EEG. Here are the references for the presentation, and this is the end of the technical component.